I was probably, I don't know, three, four years old. It was a rainy day and I wanted to do something else. I don't know what I wanted to do. As a little kid, I had all kinds of projects I wanted to work on and most of them were outside. I was always an outside kid and it began to rain. And I was, well, I probably did use one of the, the few cuss words that I knew at the time. Uh, and saying to my dad that it was raining and everything I'd planned uh, was now, I couldn't do it. And he looked me right in the eye and with a very serious look, no smile, never curse the rain, Jerry. And I've never forgotten that because I knew later what he meant because our farm was sandy. We never had enough rain. And for the crops to amount to anything, every drop of water that fell on our land was precious. And I grew up seeing water not just as something that helped our crops grow, which it surely did, but something that had to be respected. And indeed to see it as something sacred. It is something we've got to cherish. Our very lives depend on water. I am trying my darndest to help people through my stories realize that there's another way of thinking about our relationship to water. And not everybody has had that opportunity that I've had to grow up at a time in a place where water was not in abundance. So water has meant a lot to me. It's been a part of my life all along. I don't do much fishing anymore. I used to do a lot of it, both in summer and in winter. I did a lot of swimming and I enjoyed it. It's a way to teach my kids something about the relationship of water to nature and the appreciation of it. It's been integral all along. Never curse the rain. Jerry Apps, Never Curse the Rain, was funded in part by Greg and Carol Griffin, Ron and Colleen Wires, Stanley J. Cottrell Fund, Joel and Carol Gaynor, Wisconsin History Fund, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. It was the 31st day of January in 1938. A day after we'd had a considerable sized blizzard that had blocked all the roads, the temperature had dipped down to about 15 below zero. And I was uh, three and a half years old, and I didn't know what the heck was going on. I thought my mother maybe gained a little weight. I didn't have this figured out. And lo and behold, my dad hitched the team to the sleigh and headed for the schoolhouse mile from our farm. And they had called Dr. Beck from Watoma, who was going to meet him at the school because the road past the school had been plowed. He picked up Dr. Beck driving across the fields because you couldn't drive on the road. It was just a mess. And they arrived at the house. Sometime during the night, all of this happened. I came downstairs in the morning and there, the stove was red hot. You could, you could see the, the cherry red stove. And I came downstairs and there were these two naked babies on the kitchen, on the dining room table. Where did they come from and why are they here? Was the question I asked. I did not get a decent answer. <laughs> and, and so that these, my twin brothers, there, there they were, Donald and Daryl. Uh, Donald was the older one, Daryl was the younger one, Donald was pretty frail. He was a skinny little guy. Well, as the months went along, the doctor was not too sure he was going to live. And my mother was concerned about the fact that none of us were baptized. But Reverend Vevel agreed to come out to the farm on a Wednesday evening in July. They were born in January. Donald was not doing well. 
And the preacher said, I'll get some water from the water pail. And I'm looking at that, you know, what's special about the water pail water? Pours in a little pan and adds a little warm water. And then he proceeds to baptize my brother Donald. He's in the name of the Father. And I, what Father is he talking about, for heaven's sakes? And they said, but the Holy Ghost he brought. Jeez, I don't know anything about ghosts. I, the only ghosts I know about are at Halloween time. I said, but what is going on here? Dribbling a little water on my brother and saying these mysterious things. And at four, I was skeptical of everything. I mean, what little kid isn't? And this stuff made no sense to me, whatever. And he said, well, what about this other one? That's Daryl. You all do him too. And then he said, what about Jerry over there? Is he baptized? No, well, we better do him too. Well, gee whiz. Now, I got the full treatment. They took me over there, just dumped water, almost dumped on my head. There wasn't a sprinkle. It was the full treatment. I'm still curious at this moment about this father, son, and Holy Ghost business. I mean, what is happening to me? And then the pastor said, you realize, of course, that this is holy water. It did seem like regular water to me, but now we were baptized and we were all set. And the preacher ended it all by saying, you are now children of God. I thought, well, good, good for us. I, I didn't realize that that was a big deal because I didn't feel any different than a little while ago, except now my head seemed a little cleaner. <laughs> Our pump was powered by a windmill, and all of the water used in the house was provided by the windmill, and my two brothers and I, as one of our daily chores, was to carry water into the house. And the water pail sat by the sink, and that water pail was the source of all of the water for cooking, for washing, for toothbrushing, uh, everything. And just one, well, I don't know how many pails of water we would carry in a day, but not many. It was really kind of interesting. Uh, but two times uh, of the week when we had a bath on Saturday night, we had to carry in more water, of course, to fill the wash tub. And that was, um, well, we put up with that because we knew we were going to go to town afterwards and going to town once a week was a big deal. The other time when we carried way too much water in our estimation was on wash day when we had to fill up the old washing machine and the wash tubs and all of that. And the third time, which was, um, well, we knew it was going to happen about every July when Mabel and George Rankard would come out from Chicago uh, in their old, big old Dodge car, and they would stay with us for two weeks. Why, I have never figured out. We had no electricity, no indoor plumbing, nothing. And George was a very nice guy. He didn't do anything, sat under a tree most of the time, uh, looking out over the pasture. I guess he just liked to watch the cows in the pasture. Mabel, however, figured she had to help with the cooking, and her idea of cooking was everything had to be scrubbed and there had to be water and everything. And she, as soon as she arrived, one of the first things she would say was, Jerry, could you fetch me a pail of water? Uh, oh, sure, carry in the water. And uh, 10 minutes later, 10 minutes later, maybe 50, could you fetch me another? What happened to the first pail of water, for heaven's sakes? I wanted to ask, I never did. Uh, carry in that next pail of water. And pretty soon Jerry came up missing. I, Jerry found other things to do when Mabel was around and my two younger brothers, they were still around. Uh, Donald, could you get a pail? Oh yes, of course. And then Donald came up missing and then it was Daryl's turn and then he came up missing and Mabel said, where are those boys? There's, they, we need water. And so, Herman, could you get a pail of water for me? That's my dad. And Pa would not be too happy about that because not only were we carrying a lot of water, we were using a lot of water. And he wanted the water for the cattle. He didn't want it in the house. To carry in a pail of water every 15, 20 minutes, half an hour was not only unbelievable, it was almost obscene. My dad would roll his eyes and say, what is wrong with this woman? She could not believe that my mother could get by with so little water, and she did not appreciate nor understand how precious water was to us and how every drop of it had to come from our well. And in those days, before we had electricity, every drop of water depended on the wind turning the windmill. So my dad was very, very careful about the water that he used. 
back in the 30s, we had not only a Great Depression, but we had severe drought in several parts of the United States. The Dust Bowl just raised havoc. The wind would blow day after day, and the fine talcum-like dust from the soil would filter into the house. And it was very, very dry, obviously, with no rain. But as long as the wind blew, the windmill turned. And even though the cows had little to eat, the pastures were drying up, the hay crop was meager, we were getting by, just. And then one day, the wind quit blowing and the windmill quit turning. And the most pitiful sound in the world is the sound of cattle that are thirsty. They would bellow all night long. I could hear them in my bedroom. And my dad would spend each afternoon looking to the western sky to see if there was any sign of a storm coming, any sign that the wind might start blowing again, but the wind did not blow. We were desperate. We've had 12, 14 cattle, a team of horses, and Pa was more concerned about the livestock than he was about his family, but we hadn't anything to drink either. And one of our neighbors, Alan Davis was his name, he lived a half a mile, maybe a mile to the north of us. Pa knew that he had a gasoline engine because he lived down in a hollow and the windmill wouldn't work there very well. And so we loaded up a bunch of milk cans, 10 gallon milk cans, put them on a wagon, team of horses, drove down to Allen's farm, filled these cans with water, brought them back, dumped them into the stock tank. And now we've got the cattle and the horses all running into each other, fighting to get a drink of water. It's a terrible time. And we saved enough, a pail of water for the house so we could have a drink of water and my mother could do some cooking with water. And Pa was just troubled beyond belief that we had to depend on the neighbor. And it was about the next day, in the middle of the night, I heard the wind come up. And generally we're not pleased when the wind is blowing because they were blowing dust all the time. But this time I knew what was happening because the wind came up and then you could hear this windmill, it squeaked and squawked, and then it began turning. And I knew the pump was working then, and I knew that Pa would be a lot happier, as was my mother. When I came downstairs in the morning, everybody was smiling because the stock tank was full. And the windmill, of course, had been turning. But Pa was concerned that another day the wind would stop. And he looked in the farm newspapers for ads and so he bought a monitor gasoline engine built specifically to replace a windmill. It looked just like a bunch of cast iron. Hooked this thing up, took a half a day to get it hooked up. Kaboom, the machine went. Then kaboom, kaboom, and the pump had been going up and down, and the water began running. Kaboom, everything shook, and, and, and I thought things were going to fly apart, but now we had water dependable water, and we used that monitor engine until we got electricity, which was a number of years later. The first people that moved into the area would make sure they were by a stream or a lake, because life depends on water. And farmers, if you're gonna be a successful farmer, water was absolutely critical. Water was precious then, it's precious still today. I'm John Muskowski, the director of Wisconsin Public Television, in the studios with Jerry Apps and uh, presenting uh, this new program, uh, Jerry Apps Never Curse the Rain, which is companion to your new book. Yes. Which and is I'm, called? Uh, same title, Never, Never Curse Never the Rain. Rain. There's a little more to it. A Farm Boy's Reflections on Water. So explain to folks about why Never Curse the Rain. Well, this, uh, I, I've been so privileged. This is the fourth documentary I've done. And the previous one uh, focused on the land. That's the title of it. And its, um, its theme is we've got to take care of the soil. Uh, in this state and in this country, this one's about water. And how we must take care of water. Uh, it's going to be one of the major issues, if it's not already, of the day. And I talk about that in here with stories from my childhood, with, with contemporary information as well. 
So uh, stay with us. And right now, I'd like to invite you to support Wisconsin Public Television and support the great Wisconsin programs on Wisconsin Public Television with a call to pledge your support to viewer-supported television with a gift of $10 a month. We have the DVD of the program that you're enjoying and Jerry's new book. That's uh, from the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. Um, that's available to you when you contribute to Wisconsin Public Television. The program will continue, and Jerry and I will talk a little bit more about this project. But we hope you'll give us a call at 800 236 3636. Thank you, John. I'm Kerman Eckes on the staff here at Wisconsin Public Television. And when you call and join us as a member this evening, we have some wonderful thank you gifts that are, that are of course, uh, right in line with Jerry's wonderful program that we're watching. I want, would like to run through those briefly for you right now. If you call and become a member with a $6, uh, $6 a month ongoing contribution, we will send you a copy of Never Curse the Rain, this brand new program that we're premiering uh, and that's new to Wisconsin Public Television. Uh, it's a great way to go back, see the scenes again, listen to Jerry's stories once again. Uh, um, and that's a wonderful gift that we can send you. If you call and join us with a $10 a month donation, we will send you a copy of both the DVD and the book that uh, John and Jer Jerry were just talking about, Never Curse the Rain. There's even more stories in the book, more, more of Jerry's storytelling style, which is so fabulous. Again, that's a wonderful combination package. Then if you call us and become a member at the $20 a month ongoing donation level, we will send you what I'm calling the Ultimate Jerry Apps Collectors, Collectors Package. We will send you all four the DVDs of the Jerry Apps DVDs that we have been done here at, for Wisconsin Public Television plus the book Never Curse the Rain, an additional book called Old Farm, and this is a, a, a beautiful book that was done with, a, 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 with, with Jerry and his son Steve doing the photographs, and we will send you a beautiful, absolutely beautiful digital print with uh, John Zim's beautiful artwork. So we have many ways to thank you, but now we need you to go to those phones and give us a call at 1-800-236-3636. Hi, I'm Inga Witcher, fourth generation dairy farmer and host of the Wisconsin Public Television series, Around the Farm Table. I love to be able to tell the stories of Wisconsin farmers, uh, the, what they're doing currently, and I loved growing up on my family's farm. I grew up right next to my grandfather, helping him feed calves with my dad in the barn milking cows. Unfortunately, my grandpa wasn't much of a talker, so he didn't get to share with me the stories of when he was farming or when his parents were farming. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy reading and watching Jerry Apps. It makes me feel connected to those other generations of farmers. And it's important to continue telling these stories of the farmers here in Wisconsin and all over the world. And I thank Jerry for doing that for my generation. And I hope that you'll thank him by calling in. We'd love to hear the phone ring. It's one 800 236 3636. Well, thanks for your calls. Uh, please give us a call at 800 236 3636. Remember, we have the DVD available with a gift of $6 a month, um, the DVD and the book available with a $10 a month gift, and then at $20 a month, we have DVDs and books and lots of stuff. Lots of uh, Jerry App stuff that's available. You know, uh, farms have an, an ag agricultural, the in agriculture is a really important part of our state. Indeed it is. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the reasons I do this work and write these books and do the documentaries is to help, is to help people understand how important farming has been and continues to be and to help people understand that farmers know how to take care of the land. They are concerned about water. And I am uh, trying to, I, I'm, I'm a farmer myself. I still run a 120-acre farm in, in Washera County. And, and I, I, I appreciate personally what it is to take care of the land and to pay attention to water. And I'm trying to remind people in my work that, that people should appreciate what farmers are trying to do in not only feeding us, but in, in, taking care, in, in taking care of the resources that are necessary uh, for our food to be produced. Well, you can uh, you enjoy in the first part of this program. You just see the uh, this really connection, uh, uh, and it's able to share these stories that's so important to our state, so important to our families, and so important to our country. Um, presented uh, by Jerry Apps with Wisconsin Public Television. It's great to hear the phones ring. Why don't you call us at eight hundred two three six three six three six. 
And if you already have called, we're starting to get busy in the studio. Thank you so much for making that call and showing your support for Wisconsin Public Television. There's still plenty of time for you to call us and become a member and get back to the show, knowing you've helped to, to uh, support that program. When you do, again, we have some thank you gifts. If you call with a $6 a month ongoing donation, we will send you a copy of the show that we're watching, a DVD version of Never Curse the Rain. If you call with a $10 a month ongoing donation, we'll send you both the DVD of the show plus the book, Never Curse the Rain. That's the brand new publication by Jerry. And we have that uh, for $20 a month ongoing contribution. We have that fabulous package that includes all four of the Wisconsin Public Television documentaries that Jerry has done. Um, so that's Farm Story, Farm Winter, The Land, and um, Never Curse the Rain. Plus, we'll send you two books, Never Curse the Rain, and a fabulous book called uh, Old Farm. And that's a, a collaboration bet between Jerry and his son. It has beautiful, beautiful photographs that Jerry's son Steve has taken, more of Jerry's stories. So it's a great combination to have. Plus, we have an absolutely beautiful digital print. This is a very high quality print. It measures about 13 by 9 inches. It is signed by both uh, Jerry and John Zim, the, the artist, and it features three of uh, Zim's wonderful uh, illustrations. So it's a fabulous package for you. If you're a fan of Jerry Apps, it's something that you certainly want to ask about. But it all starts by going to those phones and dialing 1 800 236 3636. Think about becoming a sustainer today. It's easy to do. All you need to do is call in today, talk to one of our volunteers, and what it means to become a sustainer is you give us your, uh, this, <laughs> maybe this doesn't sound right, but you give us your credit card information or your bank account, and then we can, t you, you donate a certain amount, whatever you can every month. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to renew your membership on paper. You don't ever have to call in again. It's easy, and we want you to do whatever is affordable for you. It's you that puts the public and public television and tonight we're asking you to come together with us as a team to help sustain these amazing shows call in right now 1-800-236-3636 thanks and uh thanks for your call again with the gift of six dollars a month we have the a video and the, the program and the book is available as well but jerry we have just a couple seconds for you one thing that you really important to you is inspiring people to share their story Yes, I write stories, I tell stories, and I'm encouraging everybody, farmers especially, to write down their stories. Thank you. Back in the 1940s, when we were in the midst of World War II, and I was so oh, eight, nine years old. The crops by July were drying up. The pastures were slim. The oat crop was not much of anything. The corn was withered. Every afternoon when the chores were done, my pa and I, we'd stand out by the barn and we'd look to the west to see if the weather had any hope of, of a rainstorm. And my dad was very good at predicting the weather by looking at the western sky and the weather vane wind direction and the cloud formations, he could predict the weather. Well, this particular afternoon, after evening after evening, and not seeing any sign of a storm, he saw something I couldn't see. He said, see those clouds on the horizon? I could barely see them. He said, I think it's gonna to rain tonight. Came into the house, lit the lamp on the table, it was just getting dark. Uh, and we we're all sitting around, dad reading the newspaper, and my brothers and I fooling around with something or other. About nine o'clock, my mother said, well, it's time to go to bed. And so that's when we went to bed, generally blew out the lamp, took my lamp, went up to bed. And my little room was on the end of the house. The two windows in the bedroom were open and stifling hot in the bedroom. But I had hoped that Pa was right, that it might rain. And it must have been about midnight. And I heard this growl, this thunder in the distance, that wonderful sound. When it's dry weather, you listen for the growl of the thunder in the distance. And then I look, I, I got up and looked out the window and it awakened me and I saw a flash of lightning. And another louder clap of thunder. And the sky was a menacing conglomeration of clouds rolling and tumbling and fighting with each other, which I could see with each flash of lightning. And then Pa called up the stairs. He said, boys, wake up. 
wake up and come downstairs. He did that maybe once or twice a year because he wanted everybody dressed in case the wind did something to the barn or if there was a terrific hailstorm, lightning struck something. The Wildrose Fire Department remained in Wildrose. And if there ever was a fire, and a lightning fire was not uncommon, uh, we were on our own. And the worst possible thing that could happen to a farmer in late summer, when the barn was full of hay, was to have lightning strike it and destroy the winter's supply of hay. So he was deathly afraid of fire, and lightning was one form of it, of course. And so we were all in the dining room, watching out the window this storm, this menacing storm. And why in heaven's sake did the storm have to be so mean? Why couldn't it just rain? My mother would ask that question. The storm got closer and this gust of wind came and it shook the windows a little bit, but it wasn't that severe. And immediately the temperature dropped probably 20 degrees, at least 10. And there wasn't any hail, but it just dumped. The rain came down and we, if you, if you ever saw a family happy with an event that was as natural as rain, it was at that time. Because farmers, if they had nothing else going for them, they always had hope. And the hope was, in this instance, was for some rain because it would save the crops, it would save the garden, we would have something to eat during the winter, the cows would have some feed again. And Pa said, you can go back up to bed now. He looked at his watch, it's three o'clock. You've got a couple of hours yet before you have to get up. Crawled into bed, and 5.30 the next morning, it all started over again. What we ordinarily did on a rainy day, would crawl up into the barn, and listen to the rain drum on the barn roof. Wonderful sound, never forgotten it. The smell of sweet clover and drying alfalfa. I was afraid Pa was going to say, let's go hold the potatoes. It stopped raining, just a little drizzle. But he didn't. He said, you know, this might be a day to go fishing. He didn't say that very often in the summertime. We fished a lot in the winter, but in the summertime, there was work to be done, always work to be done. So I found the six tine fork and went out back of the hen house and dug some worms and put them in a can. Found the 16 foot long cane poles that we had tucked under the corn crib eaves. Tied them across the top of the 36 Plymouth, piled in the Plymouth and drove over to Norwegian Lake. And Pa knew the Andersons who lived at a farm right by the lake and they rented boats. The boat rental was a dollar a day and a day was an hour or 12 hours, whatever you wanted to call it, it was one dollar. And so Pa went in the shed and picked up a pair of oars. We drove on down to the lake and here were these, wood, these were all wooden boats. They, they were, I don't know, somebody made them, I suspect. And they were sort of half sunk in the lake and we looked around to see one that looked like it would be halfway decent, pulled it out, tipped it over, dumped the water out all crawled in and we rode out to where the marl hole was. Many of the lakes were, had marl bottoms, marl is calcium carbonate, thousands of years old from various seashells that have accumulated there. And then it was dug out, farmers used it to fertilize, to change the acidity level of their fields. So there's a big hole in Norwegian Lake, probably 40 feet deep. And the idea was no anchor was big enough, long enough to chain the rope to drop down 40 feet. So the idea was to, to row right up to the edge of this marl hole because on a hot day in summer, the big bluegills and the big northerns are down deep where it's cool. And Pa knew this lake better than we did. And we're rowing, he's rowing, and we're looking. And we see the bottom disappear. And Pa says, well, that's it, we're over to marl hole. Now we've got to back off just a little bit. And we backed off a little bit and we dropped the anchor. And we started tossing our poles, our bobbers, into this deep hole in the marl hole. And we'd hit it. This was the day to catch fish. Soon, the bluegills were biting. I mean, my brother Donald's 
bobber went under and up came a big bluegill. My dad's bobber went under another big bluegill. Mine, uh, Daryl's, and we all, soon the bluegills were accumulating. What we did not pay attention to was that there was water accumulating in the floor of the boat. The thing leaked like a sieve. We didn't realize that. And I said to Pa, I said, Pa, I think this boat's leaking. And he kind of looked down and he said, yeah, but the fish are biting pretty, pretty well. Maybe one of you, well, both of you, we had a little pail along. You could dump some of the water out as it accumulated. And so we're dumping water and catching fish and just continuing to do that for about an hour. But we could not keep ahead of the water that was accumulating now up to our shoes and covering our shoes. And I said, Pa, this boat's going to sink. We had no life preservers. There wasn't anything like that. And Pa didn't seem to mind that the boat might sink because the fish were really biting. I mean, we'd had 25, 30, 40 bluegills. And I'm not exaggerating. The bluegills were just big around. I mean, they were just wonderful. But if the boat sank, well, what difference would it make? And we're, we're quite a ways from shore. We're a good 100 yards, maybe more than that. And we're bailing and, and, and still fishing. And Pa finally says, I think we probably ought to uh, hang it up for the day. We got enough fish. And now the boat's got, I don't know, probably that much water in it. We just couldn't bail fast enough. We got the boat up to shore. We, we were there safe and sound, got home, cleaned the fish. One of the things we had learned early in all of these adventures, never tell Ma any details of what went on because she would have chewed out my dad like you can't imagine. So we're all smirking as we're cleaning these bluegills and Ma's prepared with the great big old cast iron skillet on the wood stove, put in a big hunk of lard and put these fish in there and fry them up and crisp. And my dad said, there's nothing sweeter then bluegills caught in cold water, and we had a wonderful fish dinner and a memory. Are we going back to Norwegian Lake? And if we do, let's remember the boat that we were in and not select that one again. fall that I turned 12 years old, I was able to get a hunting license. Farm kids were hunting, of course, as soon as they were big enough to handle a rifle, but we couldn't deer hunt. So I'm 12 years old and my dad and Bill Miller, the neighbor half a mile away, had been going for several years. But now, now I had the opportunity to go along. Well, there was a 12 gauge double barrel shotgun that weighed about, <clears throat> well, it weighed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm to use this, it was a blunderbuss, the thing, I mean, it had a barrel, it never quit, you could hardly see the end of it. Well, this is a bit of an exaggeration. And we had slugs, anybody that knows about deer hunting knows that when you deer hunt, you don't use fine shot, you use slugs. Well, when that shotgun went off, I mean, it. if you were standing up out in the open, it would drive you back two feet. I mean, it was wicked. It was very much like a horse kicking you on the shoulder when the thing went off. So I was a little fearful of this big old shotgun. We drive to Adams County. It's a beautiful day in late November. To make the hunt really work, it was good to have somebody walking through the woods to scare out the deer toward those who were standing on the other end. And my dad had selected me as the novice to perform that role. And so he dumps me off and he says, uh, Bill and I are gonna go on the other end of the woods about a mile away. And he said, now you won't get lost. All you have to do is walk along the river, right? which is true. I'm walking along the river and that big blunder bus of a 12 gauge got so heavy and I'm tired, and we had to get up at 4.30 to milk the cows in order to get there. So I lean it up against a tree, and I sit down, and I look at the river. Well, lo and behold, as I'm looking at the river, here comes what looks like a dog, swimming along, just his head sticking out. And this creature sees me, and it's, my gosh, I about jumped out of my skin. There was this slap on the water as loud as a rifle shot. 
Well, it was a beaver, of course, and this big old beaver pounded his tail on the water, which is the common way that beavers told the rest of the beavers that there was trouble ahead. I'd never seen a beaver. And I look upstream and I can see the beaver dam. And I'm watching these beavers now work at this dam. It was a fantastic thing to see. I mean, it almost was better than hunting deer. And then I thought, I better get on doing what I'm supposed to do. So I picked up my own blunderbuss and I wandered on through the woods. And after a half an hour or so, I come upon Pa. And he said, where have you been? And I said, well, I just been taking my time. I would not admit that I was sitting there on the riverbank watching the beavers and having a wonderful time. Pa said, you should walk a little faster if we're going to get any deer this year. about 1948, uh, I was in high school. And it had been an interesting winter, a lot of snow, and come spring, it warmed up in March, uh, up to, I don't know, must have been in the 70s. And the snow melted fiercely, and the, our country where I grew up has a lot of hills and valleys, and the valleys quickly filled with water, including the roads were flooded. And so the school bus couldn't come by, nor could the milkman, nor could anybody. It's just like a winter storm. It's the unexpected in nature that I have always found fascinating, uh, whether it's a, a fierce storm or a flood, or it, it's what you don't expect to happen. Especially in our area, the idea of a flood was unknown in sand country. The ground was frozen. That's why the water didn't recede. And so when the unexpected happens, and my dad was good at this, his comment was, well, you gotta make do. You take what's given to you, rather than sit back and say, oh my, you boys don't have to go to school now, and I don't know what we're gonna do, and the milkman can't come by, and, and what we're gonna do, all the milk and all that. He said, well, you guys can walk to school. I used to walk a long ways, we good for you. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was such fun to brag to the town kids who were a bunch of wimps anyway, that we just walked four and a half miles to get to school. We impressed our teachers unbelievably how we would do that. Well, what happened was when all these valleys froze over, the water didn't disappear, but there's about two inches of ice. So it took another two, three weeks before the water receded enough so that the school bus could come by and things would return back to normal and we didn't have to walk nine miles round trip to school, for heaven's sake. But th this community of kids, there must have been a half a dozen of us walking, walking to school. I mean, we just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And to get there and be able to brag, oh man. I mean, we country kids were short on bragging rights anyway. The town kids had all the advantages, we thought. I mean, we didn't have electricity or anything. And now we could brag, by golly, we're in school even though the school bus didn't make it. Oh, good golly, Miss Molly. When I turned 18 years old, there was still on the books a law in Wisconsin that said you could drink beer but not liquor or wine. And so there were beer bars all over the place just for 18-year-olds. And Lakeside Lodge in Hancock, now gone, uh, had such a beer bar. And they also had this wonderful dance hall. And every Saturday night, all year round, I don't think they missed a Saturday night. Maybe it was Christmas Eve they didn't perform. But they invited in a polka band. And finally, I <laughs> loved to polka. It took me a long time to learn how to do it. But here we would all show up. It was 50 cents is, is what it cost to get into the dance hall. And they would play all these wonderful polkas, the beer barrel polka. The, we call it the butcher polka. Butcher arms around me, honey, hold me tight. And we, we knew all the words to these songs. And, and then they would do the old time waltzes, the Tennessee waltz. I was waltzing with my darling to the Tennessee waltz. You probably want to take that part out. <laughs> I mean, it was just fantastic. And of course, we were there with our girlfriends showing off our dance steps. None of us could dance with the hoop. The girls all knew how to dance. But the big deal was 
going into the 18-year-old bar where you could get, I think, five seven-ounce bottles of Blatt's beer for a dollar, something like that. I mean, it was, it was absurd. Well, we didn't have any money either, so we'd get our dollars worth of beer and that was about it. But the thing that I remember most is the Lakeside Lodge was right on this wonderful lake. And there was often a full moon when we we're trying to impress our dates and we would take them down to the beach and with the moon rising and the bullfrogs, harump, harump. I mean, why wouldn't that impress a girl to hear that wonderful sound of a bullfrog? <laughs> While we're walking along the beach, and in the background, the butcher's song, put your arms around me, honey, hold me tight, <laughs> is playing. I mean, it was the best, absolutely the best. And, and of course, the band every so often would take a break, and then we, a bunch of us would walk along the beach, and then they would, uh, the, you would hear the announcers say, well, we're now going to do a shottish. And we'd do the circle two-step, and then they would play some drag-along dance that some of us who didn't dance very well, we could cuddle up a little closer to our dates. The beach and the lake made it what it was because the moonlight on the lake, I mean, who couldn't be impressed? And we, of course, after a couple of these cheap beers, were trying our darndest to impress our dates, which, as it turned out, we're not very impressed. <laughs> I, I have long forgotten who these girls were, almost a different one every Saturday night. But these dances were absolutely fantastic. And people in my mind sometimes fail to realize uh, that in this life there's more than economics and the idea of just sitting by a lake and watching it has value that exceeds most anything that you could write in your checkbook. I grew up understanding that. These lakes were created 10,000 years ago when the last glacier receded. We see natural vegetation all around it. And if you went out into it, my guess is that you could look probably to the bottom because there's no external pollution. It's a natural environment. And when I say that lake is 10,000 years old, it is. That's a long time. The extent to which our society can continue, and maybe this is an exaggeration, will depend on the extent to which some of this can be maintained to remind us that that nature is important in our lives and lakes and water are essential. We bought our farm 50 years ago now. The house had burned and we were trying to turn the granary into a cabin but there was no indoor plumbing. There was no running water in the house. The only source of water we had was this well. We did have electricity that I'd put in and we had an electric pump jack that moved the pump rods up and down so we had water, but not very much water. And we had to carry water, of course, to the house. Well, I couldn't afford to put a well in to have a decent system. And I tell you the truth, I'm happy that we didn't because, and this may sound cruel, but I really wanted my kids to experience something. We had three kids, some of what I did. And my mom was determined to keep us clean, even though we were outside every day all summer getting really filthy, crawling around in the woods and barefoot and running around getting really dirty. So she just determined that we would at least have clean feet while we went to bed. And uh, my mom decided that was not enough of washing. It didn't count as washing up, so we needed the whole shower experience. I don't know where I came up with the idea, but I thought maybe we could figure out a way of making a out, an outdoor shower. That would be kind of interesting. Well, how are you going to make an outdoor shower? And I thought about that. My neighbor at the time in Madison ran a hardware store, Ellis Hardware. And I said, Maury, I want you to help me with uh, something I'm thinking about. And he said, now, what are you trying to make? I said, I'm trying to make an outdoor shower. Here's the idea. Let's start with a 14-quart pail. You got some of those around here? Yes, I do. Cut a hole in the bottom, and then I want you to put about a foot 
or so of garden hose, uh, fasten that in there so that it doesn't leak. You know how to do that, I don't. He said, yes, I can do that. And I said, the other end of the garden hose, put a garden sprinkler thing in the spigot on the bottom, had a little schnozzle on it so you could turn it off and on, which is very important. So uh, then uh, the kids and I went down in the woods and we cut three long poles, locust tree poles, brought them up, we set them up as a tripod about eight feet high, wired the hay wired the top together, set it up as a tripod. This is a picture of our one pail shower. My dad on a ladder and the one pail shower was on a pulley system so you could pull it up and down. It was one of my dad's finest inventions. So, how do you not freeze to death because the water coming out of the pumps about, I don't know, 50 degrees or 45, something like that. So we would warm up some water on a cook stove. We had a wood cook stove with a tea kettle. Warm up the water there, put some cold water in the pail, put some uh, hot water in it, so it's just nice. Pull it up, crawl under there. Well then, Susie and my wife said, well, geez, we're not gonna take a shower standing out here in the buff in the open. You're gonna have to put something around that thing. So I wrapped a canvas around the thing, and now it was complete. I said, if you're gonna take a shower now, there's gotta be at least three showers for every pail. They said, what? I try it and see, and, and it works. You don't need a whole lot of water to take a shower. I was keenly interested at that time in helping the kids understand that water is not, it's pretty darn precious, and I grew up without very much water, and I thought it'd be interesting for them to realize that, yeah, you can take a shower with a whole, with not very much water. Then I struck the, the most wonderful thing, idea I'd come up with in a very long time, was an incentive for doing good work that was different than uh, 50 cents. If you work hard today in the garden, you will be eligible for a whole pail shower. Wonderful, I mean, they work so hard and that's still the big joke of the family. Have you done enough to earn a whole pail shower yet? <laughs> now one of the things they want me to do, I may do it, is to reconstruct the whole pail shower so that the grandkids and now the great grandkids can experience it. <laughs> I really wanted a 17-foot aluminum Grumman canoe. I said to Ruth, what would you think, my wife, what would you think, my why would you want a canoe when you got a boat? I said, well, a canoe is kind of neat and the kids might like it too. And she said, I think your dad thinks they're not safe. I've heard him say that too, I said. <laughs> well, I took the canoe down to the pond and I don't know what the kids were, maybe eight, nine, and 10, something like that, 10, 11, 12. And I said, now, you guys can go out here in a canoe anytime you want, uh, but you've got to wear a life vest. And before you even get in the canoe, I want to tell you something about how to operate the thing. And I showed them how to paddle. And then I said, now, I want you, each one of you, to take the canoe by yourself out in the middle of the pond and see if you can tip it over so that you know what the characteristics of the canoe are. And by golly, they had a stand on the side to tip the canoe over, of course. And I then had to confront my father. You don't confront your father generally. But there are times when it's necessary to point out to someone who has the power in the family that he was wrong. And I said, Pa, canoes are safe. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, I am. And we never talked about it again. So over the years, that canoe has, we've done many, many canoe trips with it. It looks like it's been through the war. It's all scratched up and dented up and bent. Still doesn't leak, not a hole in it, but it has a lot of memories. There's a very special place in Northern Minnesota where my kids and I have one time or another gone for 25 years, and that's the Boundary Waters. It is a million acres of pristine lakes and forests. It is a place where there are bear and wolves that howl. There is no sound pollution. There's no light pollution. It's a place for contemplation. It's a place to discover who you are. It's a place to get in touch with nature in a way that, uh, well, 
my farm comes close, but that's such a special place. It's also restful. The sound of water lapping on a rocky shore in a rhythmic kind of way, the interaction of rocks and water is really kind of interesting. And then how that sound changes with the intensity of the wind, where sort of a gentle message to a, a shouting a story of, of history and the past and all the rest of it as the waves come splashing in. And you wonder, how did the voyagers manage with their canoes when the weather was this rough and we're not able to manage with a 17-foot Roman canoe that's built like a tank? We stay in a tent on the banks of a lake and we so much enjoy any rainstorm that comes by. I love the sound of rain on canvas. I mean, it's just wonderful. And the stories are told over and over as the family comes together to think about the beautiful places where we have been, and we've been a lot of them. Steve and I were coming out one year, and Steve's in the back, he's steering and paddling, I'm in the front. I'm looking for stones, a lot of stones in the water and the boundary waters. Foggy, misty, beautiful morning. And I say, Steve, stone ahead, left. Bigger stone. Steve, the stone's getting bigger. Stop. It's a moose. <laughs> there was a moose feeding on the bottom. The, the, the moose, just like a, some kind of a miracle, come, comes out of the water. And there's this whole big moose. And Steve says, what do I do? I said, geez, I don't know, but I wouldn't do anything if I were you. <laughs> The moose stood there, and we stopped paddling. We're looking at this moose. Four or five steps ahead, it could have dumped us, but it didn't. It looked us over and said, I don't think this is worth the energy. <laughs> I don't know what it thought. <laughs> Turned around, walked up on shore, and shook itself like a dog. I mean, what a experience that was. Never forgotten that. <laughs> Those are the kind of stories that we have. One more. This time, Jeff and I, made the mistake of going into the Boundary Waters without a map. <laughs> uh, we'd been there for 10, 12 years, and I said, ah, Jeff, we don't need a map. We know where we're going. Right. So we are lost, and we're going along, and we come upon an island. And I said, Jeff, look over on the island. And here were four young women uh, bathing, uh, 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 sunbathing in the nude. Uh, and, I, and Jeff was in college then. I said, Jeff, Look over, look over to the left. Jeff said, whoa, whoa, you got the binoculars stand somewhere. <laughs> I said, no, you don't need binoculars. I said, now act like we know where we're going. So don't, don't look, just paddle. So we're going by and we're about, I don't know, 20, 30 yards away. We're paddling along and these women jump up and they're holding a big blanket up in front of themselves. And, and we paddle by and, and Jeff did get a little high. <laughs> Son of a gun, if it was a dead end, man, it turned around, come back. <laughs> This time they were ticked. Oh, they were mad. <laughs> I said, Jeff, we got to paddle a little faster this time. <laughs> well, anyway, those are some boundary water stories. <laughs> oh, my. I began teaching at the Ryan Lunder School of the Arts, and I taught there for some 32 years. And our kids were something like seven, eight, and nine when we started going there in 1971. In fact, I've taught creative writing now for 40 plus years, and I have discovered that there's, there's something magical about having a writing class, I expect any class, but a writing class, which I do, close to water. And I, I've taught on Washington Island. I still teach at the Clearing in Ellison Bay, which is right on the waters of Green Bay. And of course at Rhinelander, the lakes were everywhere. And water was one of the attractions, I think, that brought some of the students to my classes. I discovered that sort of accidentally by realizing that something was going on that I couldn't figure out, that I couldn't understand, the relationship of people to water. 
the creative juices that began flowing, and this sounds crazy maybe, but as people associated with water, watched it, played in it, did whatever they wanted with it, or, or simply it, wrote about it even, it, that there was something mysterious happening. Uh, and I still haven't figured exactly what that relationship is, but it's an important one. And I firmly believe, and I've taught this for years, that everybody has a uh, creative side to them. It's often dormant and uh, not being expressed. But water and the presence of water, in my judgment, will, will help to release that creativity that sits there and is waiting to be released. As the kids got older and grew up and had jobs and eventually married, uh, Ruth and I were there alone for several years while I was teaching. I think it was my daughter Susan said, well, wouldn't it be fun if uh, we brought uh, our spouses and our kids to Rhinelander to experience what we experienced as kids? And so that's what we did. Today, 16 years later, we are still doing that. And there's something like 15 of us when we're all together. Grandkids, now two great grandkids. It's to bring the family together in a way that we could never have anticipated. And water was a key to it, being on a lake where they could fish and water ski and just, just sit and watch the water. And what's interesting, uh, sometimes we think that the, the kids and the grandkids want to be busy all the time doing things. But every so often, I catch one of them, sometimes several of them, just sitting by themselves watching the water. So water has been the glue, if that makes sense, in bringing the family together, which we do once a year for a week or more. And it has been absolutely wonderful. We rent a boat, so those who want to water ski can do that. This year, the most fun thing the kids did was kayaking. There were four kayaks, and they were out exploring. And they would come back, these are the grandkids now, with stories about what they had seen, the big blue herons and the fish that they had seen and the water plants. And it was like they were discovering all of this. It probably was for the first time, some of them. Either consciously or sometimes unconsciously, I was intent uh, that my kids appreciate the out of doors, that they appreciate nature, that they appreciate the quiet that goes with being outdoors. I did that with my kids. I'm doing that with my grandkids. And I, um, maybe I'm doing more of it with my grandkids. I have more time to do it because I'm, uh, I don't have a nine to five job to go to. And I try to do it subtly to tell a story rather than to say, here are the points I want you to memorize. And interestingly enough, they're picking that up. It's a way of teaching that uh, I guess I have tried to follow. I taught for many years at the university, and I've pretty much been doing that with my grandkids, did that with my kids. My perspective on water uh, goes back, way back to when I was a kid. All of those experiences with my dad going fishing, with my brothers and I going swimming, of cattle not having enough water to drink. All of that helped me develop this tremendous respect for water. And I'm afraid that so many people today in our society see water as an economic commodity, something that is unending. And most of us who study this know better, it's not unending. The supply is not forever abundant. We need to watch that and watch that carefully in our overuse of water. So going way back to the days when I was a kid and learning to respect water, to cherish it, and indeed to see it as something sacred, to today when I'm trying to do that myself with limited water use, but I see so many people around me and I don't I mean to be judgmental, but so many people who see water as something that's going to economically benefit them and not worry about what it does to the environment, uh, what it does to the aquifers that draw down right here on my farm where we're sitting just now. Uh, one only has to look at my two ponds, one in back of me, one in front of me. 
both of which have less than half the water in them that they had as recently as 15 years ago. And I don't want to blame it on the irrigation that takes place in this area. Part of me doesn't want to do that. I'm a farmer. I've known farmers for years. But I also know in studying the research evidence that's been done in this area that that is a major contributor to the decline of the aquifer and the disappearance of several feet of the water table. And the thoughtful farmers know this, but there are always those that are not. So doom and gloom I probably sound, but I'm hopeful that more people will recognize that as a problem and begin to talk about it and discuss it and begin to figure out policies that will allow us to put the brakes on some of our overuse of water, some of our inappropriate use of water. And then we see these spills and we see the streams polluted. There needs to be more study at this, but that is a problem. And I don't have the solution to it, but it's happening. The Great Lakes have something like 80 plus percent of all of the fresh water in North America. Can you believe that? 80 percent. In those same Great Lakes, the 20 some percent of the world's fresh water happens to be in the Great Lakes. But, but, as we look ahead, some project by as early as 2050, we are going to have a terrific shortage of water in the world including the United States. We see evidence of it now. California has had a drought that's gone on for half, almost half a dozen years already. The southwestern states, uh, New Mexico and Arizona, have had drought. And the wildfires in the northwest, storms where we'll get inches of rain an hour. These are indicators of what we can see coming. But it's very difficult to convince somebody who has just had their car flooded out because of a recent terrific rainstorm that there's going to be a water shortage. And today it's so easy to turn on the spigot and there's the water. And for most of us it's fresh and it's safe. Increasingly that will not be so. I think my father would shake his head as I do. And he would probably start telling stories, which was his way. He had a never-ending supply of stories. To celebrate that water is sacred. Without water, death is imminent. And people have to make a living, I understand that. But the broader scheme means we've got to see the relationship of what we're doing to a bigger picture. And that means that we are all in this together. And my dad knew that. Jerry never cursed the rain. Hi, I'm John Muskowski, director of Wisconsin Public Television, here with Jerry Apps. You've just seen Never Curse the Rain, uh, this new uh, documentary companion to Never Curse the Rain, the book. Yes. Uh, and those are available to you right now with a gift of $6 a month. Uh, as we've told you, it's a great time to show your support for Wisconsin Public Television. Um, with a gift of $6 a month, we have the DVD, which I know you will enjoy watching again uh, and sharing with family, sharing with friends. And, or with a gift of $10 a month, we have the DVD and the book. And Jerry, why don't you tell them a little bit about the book and some of the stories that are in the book. Yeah, the stories uh, start out with my very first memories uh, of water. And when, that's during the Depression, I was a little kid, and the, the windmill quit turning on a very dry period of time, and the cows did not have any water. And it was a terrible, terrible thing uh, when cattle do not have enough to drink. They bellow all night long. And that's my very first memory, is we were trying to find some water for the cattle, and finally we were able to do that at the neighbors who had a, who had a gasoline engine running their pump. Well, congratulations on this uh, wonderful program. I think it really conveys uh, uh, certainly the importance of water and I think evokes a lot of memories and a reminder of uh, how um, precarious the farm is. It is. Uh, well, water is key uh, to any uh, farm operation. In fact, water is key to life. 
that we can be that broad in talking about it. Sure. It's true. So uh, please give us a call, 800-236-3636. We have the, for $6 a month, the program is available to you uh, with your call at 800-236-3636. Well, thank you, John. I'm Kermin Eckes, and you know, we've had a wonderful response to the show. Jerry Apps has always been a, a huge favorite with our viewers, and, and with good reason. The stories that Jerry tells, the, the associations, the farm stories that he tells us are, are resonate with so many of us. Farming has been such an important life of part of Wisconsin, life in Wisconsin, and that's something that Jerry really brings, brings to us here at Wisconsin Public Television. That's why we're asking you to go to those phones and give us your support, and when you do, we have those thank you gifts for you. As John mentioned, if you call and become a member with an ongoing monthly uh, gift of six dollars a month we'll send you a copy of never curse the rain this is the new uh, dvd the new installment of, of the jerry apps documentaries that we're bringing to you a partnership between wisconsin public television and the wisconsin historical society if you call and become a member at the with an ongoing monthly gift of ten dollars a month we'll send you both a copy of the dvd and the book never curse the rain and again as jerry was talking about those stories that start with his very very early memories and proceed to the current day uh, and then if you call and become a member at with an ongoing monthly gift of $20 a month. We have an absolutely fabulous package. It has four, four DVDs plus the book Never Curse the Rain and uh, uh, the book Old, Old Farm and a beautiful uh, print that we can send your way. Our volunteers can tell you more about those, but now go to those phones and give us a call at 1-800-236-3636. And stay with us. We're talking uh, about uh, have you in support Wisconsin Public Television, but also in a few minutes uh, we're going to show uh, uh, the the first segment of a farm story, which, which was, was the, the first one, which was the first uh, in this series of uh, four documentaries, where I talk about the early days on the farm when I was a kid. With a lot of response to that mm -hmm. all across the country. Well, very powerful, uh, very evocative. Uh, uh, documentary, really, and, and mostly about pre-electrification. That's right. We didn't get electricity in our home farm until what 1947, which is uh, was a long time after the folks in the cities had electricity. You know, one thing that we've heard from people too is that uh, current farmers are looking at that that as a model as they try to uh, reduce energy costs and things sure, like that. Sure. So. Yeah, we, we used very little energy in those days. Fifteen cents for a gallon of kerosene and it lasts just a week. Mm -hmm. So we're going to uh, go to a farm story in a few minutes, but please join us with your phone call at 800-236-3636. Well, and before we do that, we have plenty, you have plenty of time to join us as a member of Wisconsin Public Television. And, of course, we have our thank you gifts for you. Um, I want to spend a little time talking about that, uh, the, the, the gift that we have for the one-time donation of $240 or for a $20 uh, a month ongoing donation. We have, I kind of call it the perfect Jerry Apps package because it has a four, all four DVDs that Jerry has done in partnership with Wisconsin Public Television and the State Historical Society. And that includes the very first one, A Farm Story. It also includes A Farm Winter, The Land, and then of course Never Curse the Rain. It also includes the book Never Curse the Rain and a great book that Jerry did in partnership with his son. It's called Old Farm. Uh, it's a history of Jerry's farm. Plus, he says it's kind of a genealogy that you can use to tell the stories of your land and kind of protect those stories. Then it also includes this absolutely beautiful print, and I, I love this print. It uh, features the artwork of John Zim, and John's illustrations, his his work here has been uh, featured on, on the cover of some of Jerry's books. And so we have uh, a print from The Land, uh, or I'm sorry, from Winter, The Land, and then Never Curse the Rain. Um, it's done on a heavy museum quality paper. Nice archival inks have been used on this. There's a very generous margin, so you can frame this any way that you want, any way that you see fit. But what I also love is it features both Jerry's a signature and John Zim's sig signature. And so that wonderful package comes to you, as I said, for a one-time gift of $240 a month. So again, we have many different levels, many different ways of saying thank you to you for joining us at Wisconsin Public Television. But now we need you to take that first step of going to your phone and dialing 1-800-236-3636. Well, as we mentioned, we're going to in a few minutes see uh, the beginning of uh, a farm story. And this combination, farm winter, farm story, the land and the water, what a wonderful contribution to our state um, to uh, uh, sustaining and perpetuating these important stories of, uh, of Wisconsin. And as uh, Jerry mentioned, has been shared with people all over the country. We were um, driving uh, uh, about a year ago and uh, Jerry got a, a text message and a, you know, an email and his phone was lighting up and he said somewhere in public television uh, they're seeing the documentary because people reach out to him and want to thank him for this work. One way that you can do that uh, is by calling with your pledge and joining me 
joining Jerry and Ruth as supporters, as friends of Wisconsin Public Television. The phone number is on your screen. We have these great thank you gifts, uh, and you will continue this legacy of uh, great television supported by the people of Wisconsin uh, uh, and Wisconsin Public Television. The phone number is 800-236-3636. Boy, Jerry, imagine how technology has changed. You're now text messaging, and when your mother was cooking, she had to put her hand in the oven to see how well, hot it was. That's right. Well, we didn't have electricity. <laughs> You've got I mean, it easy I now. I mean, I tell you, I, I learned how to write on a, on a manual typewriter. All this electronic stuff baffles me hey, completely. I didn't even have the internet when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, one thing I'd like... I didn't know how to spell internet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to spell now. <laughs> one thing I love about having your collection of books is just, it makes me really appreciate how easy my life is on the farm these days when I can flip a switch or uh, there's my water tank is running all the time with a heated water tank in it so I don't have to worry about anything. Well th there <laughs> it was a different time to be sure uh, but it, it had its virtues and the, the old uh, uh, cook stove that was wood burning I have wonderful memories about that I, I've, I've just recently written more about the old cook stove and and, and how my mother cooked with it. And as you mentioned, there were no thermometers. She would put her hand in the oven to determine whether or not the temperature was appropriate for baking bread. Oh, well, I love adding this book to my collection of Jerry Epps, and I hope that you'll add it too by calling today 1 800 236 3636. You know, that was just a, a wonderful moment. Here are two of two very popular people that you see here on Wisconsin Public Television, people that feature stories of Wisconsin specifically, and they're here because of you, viewers that go to their phones, like all of the viewers that have been calling now and become members of Wisconsin Public Television. When you call, you, you are really helping to bring that programming to not only yourself, but to your community, to people all across the state. So it's a wonderful benefit of becoming a member of Wisconsin Public Television. Another, of course, are our thank you gifts. Don't forget, for a $6, on, a, $6 a month donation, we will send you a copy of the DVD, Never Curse the Rain. For a uh, $10 a month uh, donation, we will send you a copy of both the DVD and the book, Never Curse the Rain. And then for a $20 a month donation, we will send you that package that includes all four of the Jerry Apps DVDs, the two books, and the wonderful print that, that we mentioned earlier. So we have many ways to thank you when you become a member of Wisconsin Public Television, but we need you to go to those phones now and dial 1-800-236. 3636. This, uh, uh, Jerry's work in, uh, on television is fairly simple. And I, I remember when, uh, when Jerry, when we, we, had, we did the first show, which we're going to see in a couple minutes, of a uh, farm story. And, and Jerry was like, who would be interested in this old guy talking for, for a whole hour? And, uh, but we knew, we had seen that, and we'd seen Jerry speak to um, um, uh, uh, groups of people and and as he shared the story there's really power in this and our uh, the reason we've been able to now produce four of these programs is because of your enthusiasm and your support so we want to thank you uh, and encourage you to continue to do that with your phone call or going online at WPT.org. I think we could all listen to Jerry talk for an hour at least I, I could Jerry I could listen to you talk all night tell us about the power of storytelling why do you do this well one of, one of the things that I've discovered along the way and it goes way back when I was a kid. My dad was a fantastic storyteller. We had no electricity, we didn't have television or anything like that. <clears throat> so when we got together, we told stories. And today, I, uh, I, I teach storytelling. Uh, how to write it, how to do it orally, how to do it on radio, how to do it on television. But I, I want to encourage everybody to write down their story and share it with your family. You don't have to get it published. Share it with your family. Share it with your grandkids. It's, it's a way of tying the generations together. It's helping the generations understand the, the power of history, and the story is a, is a way to do that. And it helps connect us with, with our grandparents or uh, our children. I think it's wonderful to tell the yeah, stories. People like stories. Uh, I've discovered that. Most people, uh, and, and, and maybe this is a wrong kind of an exa uh, example, but in, in church, when the pastor starts telling a story, everybody wakes up and pays attention. Stories are powerful. I like gossip, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to hear more of Jerry's stories, please call in today and help support Wisconsin Public Television. The phone number, again, is 1-800-236-3636.
Well, in just a moment, we're going back to the, the documentary, documentary that really started it all. We're going to take a look at the beginning of A Farm Story. This is the very first documentary that Jerry did with us here at Wisconsin Public Television, and it truly is a, an absolute favorite of, of people, not only around the state, but around the country as well. It, the stories that you're going to hear are very powerful. They resonate in so many ways. They're humorous. They're everything that you expect from Jerry. So. Before we go, you still have plenty of time to join us and become a member of Wisconsin Public Television. Don't forget we have some wonderful thank you gifts, including the DVD of Never Curse the Rain. Um, those can be yours if you talk to one of our volunteers. They'll fill you in on that. But in the meantime, we want you to sit back and enjoy a, another taste of a farm story. I am one who believes that where we grew up and when we grew up influences who we are today in ways that go way beyond, in many instances, our knowledge of that fact. How we see the world, how we see our relationship with other people, how we see the land and its importance, how we view nature, all of those for those of us who grew up on farms at a time when I did, are a part of who we are today. And for a long time I was not too pleased to share it because I was enamored by the quote unquote more cosmopolitan people that I knew who had grown up in the city and knew the ways of the city. Today I'm as proud as proud can be of having experienced what I experienced, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Not that it was all wonderful, because it wasn't. We never made a whole lot of money. And all during the later years of the Depression, when I was a wee little one, things were tough. But we had work, too much work in my estimation as a kid. But we had something to eat, and I always had a roof over my head, and a pair of bib overhauls, new ones once a year or so. What more would you want? And friends, and a chance to have some fun, and to go fishing, and to go for a walk. I mean, what more is there that's important? If you go back to the middle of the Great Depression, that's when I was born, in 1934. Uh, here in Washera County, which is in the central part of the state, we had one of those terminal moraine farms where the glaciers stopped. Oh my gosh, it was stony, and it was sandy, and it was hilly. And as my dad said uh, in the spring, when we, every April, picked stones day after day, if nothing else grows on this place, if nothing else ever comes up, we can depend on our crop of stones. Our farm was 160 acres, quarter section, which was common in those days. There were 80 acres on each side of a country road, gravel, mostly dirt country road. And our farmhouse was a big house. Uh, many of the old farmhouses looked quite spacious, and they were. We had no indoor plumbing, we had no electricity, and that old house was the coldest place you could imagine because it was not insulated. People didn't know about insulation. But I have fond memories of the place. There were two doors into the house. Everyone came in the kitchen door, and there was a little porch around in the back. There was also a front door which led into the parlor. And we knew immediately when someone came to the house, if they knew or did not know about country people, if they were a salesperson out of the city, they would stumble up toward the front door. The front door wouldn't even open. You could not get the front door open. It was nailed shut. 
Anybody that knew farmers knew that you came around to the kitchen door on the porch and you rapped on the kitchen door and you were greeted by Fanny, our old farm dog who would bark two or three times, scare the bejeebers out of these city salespeople who didn't understand farm dogs either because the farm dog, I, I suspect it was a, a guard dog of some fashion, but this big collie dog was as friendly as could be. And she was mostly announcing someone's coming. And I can remember my mother being so put out with a salesperson who wouldn't get out of the car because the dog was standing there barking and she just let him sit there. The uh, kitchens on these old farm houses were enormous. They were huge. It was bigger than the dining room, larger than the uh, parlor. We never used the parlor. The parlor was for the city relatives. It's the kitchen where everything happened. The big kitchen table, wooden table with an oil cloth on it and a lamp, kerosene lamp in the middle. That was the center of all activity on our farm. My dad had his uh, place at the head of the table, my mother on the opposite end of the table. I have twin brothers and they sat on one side and I sat on the other. We never varied, we sat in those same places all the time. Just like the cows in the barn always stood in the same stall, we had our stalls. So breakfast, dinner and supper all gathered around the kitchen table. The kitchen table is where all of the decisions about the farm were made as well. What sorts of seeds should we buy for the garden this year? How are the cows doing? My mother kept all of the records. In the winter time, that was a nice warm place because the kitchen stove, the oven door was open. My mother was always baking bread and the smell of fresh bread is something that I've never forgotten. Now in the dining room was our telephone. We didn't have electricity, but we also had a telephone. It was a party line telephone. It had a ringer dinger on this side and it had a listener on that side and you open here and a mouthpiece in the front. And when you spoke into it, you knew very well that beyond the person that you were talking to, there were probably 10, 15 other people also listening in. In addition to it being our connection to the outside world, it was our safety net. Because in those days, there were no EMTs. The fire truck would not leave the village of Wild Rose, which was our nearest town, four and a half miles away. And so farmers were on their own. If there was a fire, the wind blew over your barn, somebody was gored by a bull or whatever accident might have happened you got on the phone and you rang what was called a general ring. And a general ring was ding, 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 like that. And when you heard that, you rushed to the phone because you knew one of your neighbors was in dire straits. And no matter what you were doing, and no matter how little you may have cared about that person, because farm people, everybody else, they don't all get along. You rushed to that person's place because you knew that person was in trouble and, and needed your help. Our ring was a long and three shorts, and that's what differentiated people. They knew when it was their ring that the phone was for them, but everybody else went to the phone as well. One ring in particular, three shorts, ding, ding, ding. Whenever that came in, we knew, we knew that there was something important for us to hear. If not important, at least juicy, because this family had a wonderful reputation when they first moved in, the farm had been vacant for a little while, and then we heard it had been purchased. We all gathered at this house and we all brought something to eat, we all sat around the table, and we discovered that they had five boys, but we also discovered these kids could cuss. I mean, these kids were the best cussers. They knew cuss words we'd never heard before. I mean, they could string together cuss words in such an eloquent fashion that we couldn't help but just be, it's this marvel. My mother was sitting off the side, being the good Christian woman that she was. I could see she was not taking all this in too well. And in fact, she'd whisper, I would say to my dad, we gotta go home, this is not a good place to be. By the way, when we were traveling home, my mother said, I don't want you boys, meaning my brothers and me, I don't want you ever associating with those boys again. And my dad said, listen, Eleanor, they're gonna associate with those boys. We're gonna associate with them because they are our neighbors. That's very important to, to remember. As different as they were, as unusual as they were, and maybe as sort of raw and rough as they were, they were still our neighbors. I had such a wonderful experience in sociology as a kid without ever realizing it 
because in our community, we had Welsh families, the Davies, we had German families, the Hendricks, we had Bohemian families from Czechoslovakia, the Koltas, Polish families, the Swindrzynskis and the Hudschoks, and we had English people, the Jenkses, all of us assembled together. We seldom talked about religion because we had Methodists, uh, we had Lutherans, we had Presbyterians, we had Catholics, and we had a bunch of uh, not belonging to anything, all working together, living together, farming together, and, and tell you the truth, having a wonderful time together, as you think about it. It, it was just a, a, just a fascinating time on the farm in those days. I'm the oldest, so I'm expected to be out in the barn by 30 in the morning helping with the milking. We had two barn lanterns. My dad had one, I had one. I hang my barn lantern on the nail in back of the cows on the north end of the barn. South end of the barn, my dad hangs his lantern on the nail, and the cows are all lined up. There's about 14, 16 of them, all standing in stanchions, and I have my cows to milk and he has his cows to milk. And the barn on a winter day is the warmest place on the farm. And underneath the big old Holstein cow is by far the most comfortable place you could find, as strange as that sounds. And so I would crawl under this cow, put the milk pail between my knees, sit on a three-legged stool, and grab the spigots and start milking. And a cat comes by and you squirt a little milk in the direction of the cat. <laughs> and I'm tucked under this big old Holstein and she's looking around at me and she's saying, good morning, Jerry, and I'm kind of half asleep and I'm all just getting warm. I have the easy milking cows. My dad has the tougher ones to do. When they'd come into the barn, they each knew to come into their own stall. Violet and Maisie and there would be Dolores and Florence. Everyone had its own name and we got to know every one of them. And our farm dog knew their personalities better than I did because she dealt with each cow in a very particular way and in, even in a mysterious kind of way. There's a communication between animal species that we don't understand and that was going on with Fanny talking to these cattle and they had great respect for her. Farm life was a quiet time during those years before electricity and tractors and all the rest of the noisy stuff that came along. That's when I got to know my dad. He might be in a cow right next to me and he would sometimes ask how things are going, but not usually. I would usually have to ask uh, some question and then he would answer it. Now, my dad was a wonderful storyteller. Oh my gosh. He got as far as fifth grade in school. In his generation, by the time you got big enough to work, it didn't matter how old you were, big enough to work, you worked. But I learned something very important from the fact that he only had a fifth grade education. Formal education does not necessarily equate with being smart. Uh, he knew how to fix most everything. He knew how to take care of animals and he had a wonderful way of figuring. He could figure in his head faster than most people could figure with a calculator today. He was very well liked by the neighbors. He would help anybody with anything. And you look at his face and you could tell satisfaction in his face if you did something well. But there was none of this good job stuff and all that. We, that was not just, we didn't do that. In early March, uh, when I would get up in the morning to go out to the barn, now the days are somewhat longer already, and I would look for the dripping of eaves, the first melt. You get out to the barn and Pa might see something like, I can smell spring today. And it's right, I could too. He's getting anxious because by the time we get to the middle of March, he wants to get out in the fields. There's work to be done, there's plowing to do. With a team of horses and a one bottom 16 inch walking plow. I don't remember all of that because I did it. 
And I talk to kids sometimes, and I talk about walking plows, and they think the plow was walking. The plow was not walking. I was the one that was doing the walking, and the team was walking. Frank and Charlie were their names. Plowing with a team of horses requires about four or five eyes. You gotta keep your eye on the team, you gotta keep your eye on the plow, you gotta keep your eye on where you're headed, because you wanna go in a straight line. One of the things that, that we were, you, you, you were prized for is whether you could plow in a straight line. And, and so you had a marker, of, uh, maybe your handkerchief was hanging on a tree a quarter mile away, and you see that and you're, you're plowing towards that. You got another eye looking for stones, and you'd hold on to the plow handles, and whenever the plow would hit a stone, it would leap out of the ground and you'd put it back in and go. I mean, you're just beside yourself. <laughs> Talk about my mother for a little bit. She got as far as seventh grade in school because again, her folks said, well, it's time for you to find a job. And so she became a maid when she was, I don't know, 13 years old. My mother had two major projects, the garden and the chickens, and she ruled both with a heavy hand. And we were under her employ when uh, those two things were involved. We had probably 100, 150 laying hens, white leghorns they were. And every year we'd replace some of them. The old chickens became stew in the fall and we canned the chicken meat and all that kind of stuff. But the new chicks we would order from a hatchery uh, someplace in southern Wisconsin and they would arrive at the uh, depot, uh, the train depot. And George Collum was the depot agent and he would call on the party line telephone. And he'd say, Herman, your chicks are here. And I remember going down with my dad to the depot and here are stacks of chicks. The boxes were about like that, and they were divided into little squares, and I suppose there were six or eight little chicks in each corner. And they're peeping their hearts out. I mean, it's just a wonderful sound. All these little chicks just a peeping away. And so we'd stack these little chicks in the back of the car, bring them home, take them in the house, and put them back of the wood stove to warm them up. Because this was usually in April, and it was kind of chilly. And it was kind of fun. The little chicks were just grand to watch them grow up. But when the chicks had grown up, then they found their way into the hen house. And the ones that uh, my mother had declared, uh, uh, obsolete's the wrong word, but they're not producing well anymore, pull them off the shelf. And we would have a chicken butchering day. And I tell you, one time the city cousins were out when we were butchering chickens and they could not handle the fact that there would be as many as two or three chickens running around without their heads on. And we, of course, took all this for granted. Never bought a chicken in a grocery store, and I ever remember. Never did that. It sounds terrible, and it sounds gruesome and all the rest of it, but it was a very natural progression of from the chick to the hen house to the, to the cellar shelf and to our table. We just finished watching A Farm Story. That was one of your first of the series, that right? That was. That was the very first one where I, um, well, I simply told stories about what it was like growing up during the Depression without electricity, cooking with wood stoves, heating the house with wood stoves, milking cows by hand, all the kinds of things that we took for granted back in the 1930s and 40s that are a mystery to many people today. <laughs> I've had to milk cows by hand, yeah. unfortunately, when my vacuum pump broke, and boy, am I <laughs> thankful for electricity now. Well, I tell you, you get strong fingers. <laughs> I, I, the, my strong fingers for milking cows by hand served me well when I was first working on a manual typewriter. But it's been a while since you milk cows. I mean, we could do like a little arm wrestling and see. I'm in better shape with milking cows than well, you. Well, you're probably other than I. Well, I, don't, <laughs> I, I do a lot of typing. So. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Now, you and Ruth have been supporters of Wisconsin Public Television for years and We years. have. Why is we that have. important to you? Wait, what? Why is it important to you well, to support it, such a it, station? It's one of the few places where, where, where I go, and, and my wife and I both go, to see something that, that is uh, factually based, it's well-researched, it's well-presented, and people aren't yelling at each other. I tell you, there's so much yelling going on in these. Well, if you saw these, the behind these, the scenes from around the farm table, you know yeah. that some people are yelling. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's one of the reasons we appreciate it. it it's, it's something that we uh, watch every afternoon. I, I, without fail, that's, uh, that's when the television comes on. Well, and we know that you watch, and we thank you for watching. And now is a great time to call in with your support. The phone number is 
3636. Thanks, Inga and Jerry. And we have had a fabulous evening this evening. We've had wonderful uh, calls of support from, from people all across the state saying, yes, I love Wisconsin Public Television. And of course, I want to see more of Jerry Apps on Wisconsin Public Television. And when they've called in and become a member, we've been, we're able to send them some thank you gifts. And I'd like to run the, through those briefly for you right now. If you call and become a member with a $6 a month ongoing donation, we will send you a copy of, of, the, of the original story that we watched this evening, Never Curse the Rain. So this is the latest uh, installment uh, of the Jerry Apps documentaries, a wonderful documentary. It's definitely something that you're going to want to see again. Then if you call and become a member with a $10 a month ongoing donation, we will send you a copy of the DVD and the book, Never Curse the Rain. And this is a newly published book. It's more of Jerry's stories. You can go back. Um, there are stories that we couldn't include in the documentary, so you can read those. You hear Jerry's voice in a different way by seeing having the book as well. Then we have an absolutely fabulous package uh, for a one-time gift of $240 or uh, $20 a month ongoing support and that includes four DVDs it starts with a farm story that the clips that we just watched uh, and then also has a farm winter the land and never curse the rain plus it includes the book never curse the rain and the book old old farm and this is a collaboration between Jerry and his son and outlines the history of Jerry's farm and tells you a little bit about how you can preserve the stories of your own land Plus, it also includes an absolutely beautiful print um, that features three, three uh, works from John Zim uh, and is, is assigned by both Jerry and the artist. So we have many ways to thank you when you join us as a member of Wisconsin Public Television. But we need you to go to those phones now and dial 1-800-236-3636. Thank you for uh, your calls. Thank you for your pledge. Thank you for supporting Wisconsin Public Television. Um, it's great to see this wonderful response and I also want to acknowledge some folks who were at the beginning when we had the idea for this program uh, came on board to support it to help uh, bring it to you and bring it to uh, Wisconsin. Um, that's uh, the Griffin family, uh, Greg and Carol, uh, um, uh, Ron and Colleen Wires from um, Green Bay who have supported um, uh, our Jerry Apps programs for, uh, for many years. We thank them again. Uh, our great friend Stanley Cottrell and his really wonderful gift to Wisconsin Public Television and Joel and Carol Gaynor. Carol, thanks for calling tonight. It was great to hear that you called and uh, I uh, hope we'll see you soon to thank you in person. Uh, but I want to give you a little homework too. If you know those folks, they're in your community, you know they're generous and support a lot of really important work in our state. I hope you'll reach out to them and thank them for this wonderful evening and these wonderful memories and these important stories about Wisconsin that they've helped to bring to all of us. So thank them. Thank you for uh, doing your homework. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for calling 800-236-3636. Jerry, thank you for all the amazing things that you write. I've got a stack of your books at home, and I tell you, when I'm reading them, it's like having you right beside me at the fireplace. Oh, really? <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that a lot. I love being able to watch programs that remind me of my past of farming and growing up, and, and really, all of your shows just take me right back to the stories that I would hear from my grandparents, or just the struggles that farmers had to have. And what's uncanny, when I wrote these stories, I really wrote them for my family. I had no idea that people would be interested in old-fashioned ideas about farming all across this country. I'm just humbled and, and blown away by that interest. Well, I'm just so excited that I get a chance to see you every now and then <laughs> and visit with you because I love hearing yeah, your stories. Yeah, thank you. Supporting Wisconsin Public Television is so important right now. It's, it's a way to, to, to vote almost and, and say we want to keep programs like Wisconsin Public Television on the air. Thank you so much for all of you who called in today and for the past week. It's amazing to have your support. Thank you so much. And if Back in the 1940s, we always hired a man to work with us during the summer. And this particular year, the fellow, he must have been 18, 19 years old, he came driving into the yard with a Model T Ford touring car. Today we would call it a convertible. And as the summer went on and it got hot in July and we were in the midst of haying season, Henry would say, how'd you guys like to go swimming? And we all piled in and went chugging down the dirt road. And Hank said, well, why don't I just back my car right into the lake? And we began leaping off the back. I mean, it was fantastically fun. 
And then as the sun began setting and Hank said, well, we probably ought to be getting on home. My brothers and I got behind it and we pushed it out of the lake and we went chug chugging home, crawled into bed. 5.30 the next morning, it all started over again. Jerry Apps, Never Curse the Rain, was funded in part by Greg and Carol Griffin, Ron and Colleen Wires, Stanley J. Cottrell Fund, Joel and Carol Gaynor, Wisconsin History Fund, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television.